So in this video, I'm going to show you how to do this. We're going to place a 3D object, in this case it's text, into our scene and have that object cast shadows within that scene. Putting 3D objects into DaVinci Resolve Fusion with shadows and implementing that in your scene may seem pretty straightforward, but there's actually a couple steps to it. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you now. This is the footage that I decided to use for this tutorial. The reason I chose it is because there is some movement, some depth to the scene, and of course there are the shadows. This is from ArtGrid. I will link to them in the description below. So we have our footage. We placed it in our timeline here. What I'm going to do is right click and choose new fusion clip because a lot of the work that we're going to do is going to be within fusion. So let's go to the bottom. We'll choose the fusion tab. We have our media in and media out, basically our starting and ending point. Let me just make some adjustments here. From here, I'm going to choose control space and that will bring up our list of tools. And the first thing that we're going to do is type in tracker. We'll bring in our camera tracker, which is our 3D camera tracker. So what I'll do is select that node, hold down shift so it links. We can just make sure it links there by moving it around a little bit. Now, obviously we don't see anything right now. I'll come up to the top so we just have the one window because that's all we need at the moment. Come over to the inspector on the right hand side, leave everything the way it is and click auto track. And it will go through our footage, find good tracking points, and put little track dots onto our footage. From there, we'll choose the third option over. We can leave everything the way it is, and we'll click on Solve. And this basically will tell us how good our track is. And on the right-hand side, you can see the result was 2.2, so on and so forth. That's not that great. We actually want it to be below 1. So I'll adjust this option right here, the minimum track error. Once we make that adjustment, we hit delete to get rid of those tracking points. And now we can go back up to solve and hopefully we'll get a better result. So now if you look at the average solve error, now it's 0.2, which is extremely good, especially for this kind of footage. Our footage has tracking points all over it, but it may be a little bit difficult to see because the colors of the trackers may blend in. So we'll go to the fifth option over. We don't have to make any adjustments and just choose darken image. And now they're more visible. Now we're going to place our 3D object on the ground. So we're going to select a few points that will be good indicators of where the ground is. I can left click and box select a few. And if I want to add any more to that, I can hold down shift and do the same exact thing. And those points there should be sufficient. Now I'll go back to the fourth option over, choose unaligned. In the orientation section, we want to make sure it's set to XZ ground plane, which is exactly what we're doing. And then we can click on set from selection. Once we do that without making any more adjustments, we can choose the one up top and choose set from selection there too for the origin. We'll click on export. It will create a bunch of nodes for us. Now that we have those nodes, I'm going to choose the merge node in the middle there, drag it up so that we can see it in our viewer. And you'll see our ground plane, which is the purple and all our points within the scene. Now, if you don't see this view, you can right click and might be in this perspective. What I did was right click and choose camera and then chose that camera. If I play through the footage, you can see how that purple ground plane sticks to the ground. It looks as if it's part of that road. I do want to make an adjustment, so I'll choose that ground plane node right at the bottom and then come over to the inspector on the right and rotate the Y axis a little bit so it more lines up with the road. And if we scroll through the footage, as mentioned, it looks as if it's even more a part of the scene now. In fact, I'll come over to the inspector on the right, unclick wireframe, so that's just one solid piece, and then scroll through the footage again. Our next step is to come up to the Fusion toolbar and drag down a shape. On the right hand side, you can see where it says plane, and that's perfectly fine because it's exactly what we want. Drag the node up into the viewer and you can see our plane. Now, if I connect this to the ground plane, if you look on the right hand side within our scene, it's actually laying flat again, which is exactly what we want. I'll adjust the size so that's more visible and it is in place for what we need it for. And as with the ground plane itself, if I scrub through the footage, you'll notice that it moves along with the scene and it looks as if it's part of the road. Next step is to come up to the toolbar, choose a text node. I'll grab the output from the text layer, connect it to our shape layer, and that will create a merge node. With the text node selected, on the right hand side we have the inspector, and I'll go ahead and type something in. If 
If we take that merge node and we'll drag it up, I'm going to hit control and scroll my mouse wheel because right now we're too close to see anything. Now I'll try to rotate my view. Once again, we also don't see that text and that's because both the text and the plane are on the same plane. So let's go ahead and rotate the text 90 degrees. And you may notice it on the left hand side, but it might still be a little bit hard to see. So with the text node layer selected, I'm going to change the color from white to red. And you'll notice on the right hand side, now we actually can see our footage within the scene and it's visible to our camera. It may be a little bit confusing to see the scene the way it is on the left hand side. So you right click, choose 3D options, and we can get rid of the grid. Now using the Alt key and my mouse, I'm going to make some adjustments so that we can actually see this straight on. Our next step is to add a light, and this is so that we can cast a shadow. On the toolbar at the top there, we're going to choose Spotlight, and that's actually the only light within Fusion that will cast a shadow. So we'll go ahead and connect that into our merge layer. We can see our light in the display window up there, but you'll notice that it doesn't appear to be doing anything. What we have to do is right click, choose 3D options, and then select lighting and shadows. And now we can make our adjustments. You can do that within the window by grabbing, let's say the Z axis and pulling it back, or you can use that over in the inspector window and use the translation and make your adjustments there. We're actually going to use a combination of both the translation where it is in space and rotation. So we can point the light directly at our text. If you look in the left hand viewer, you can see how that light is actually casting the shadows onto that plane now. Over in the inspector, if I wanted to make that spread a little bit wider, we can adjust the cone angle. So let's do a quick evaluation of our scene. On the right hand side, all you're seeing is that merge node that we put up there before. You're not actually seeing the end result, which is over here on the right hand side. So I'll disconnect the media out from the camera tracker, and then I will connect it from our 3D scene down at the bottom and connect that to our media out. Immediately, you'll notice that there are a few issues. Obviously, we don't want to see that plane and there's no shadows that we can see. In order to see that, I'm going to choose the camera tracker renderer, which changes it from a 3D environment to a 2D environment. And I will change it from the OpenGL renderer to the software renderer. I'll click on lighting and now we can see what we see on the left hand side and then click on shadows which gives us the shadows and then we can unclick lighting because we don't want it to look like that and we're eventually going to get rid of that plane altogether. Now your first thought may be come over to the shape 3D node which is our plane, come over to the inspector on the right hand side, go into the visibility option and uncheck visible. The problem that you run into is that it will get rid of the shadow also. As mentioned I'll come over to the second tab in the shape ID, get rid of lighting because we don't need the lighting there. And the way that we're actually going to get around this is actually chroma keying the plane. So in other words, we can just choose any color, potentially we could choose yellow, and then eventually we're going to choose a chroma key, and we're going to key out that yellow. You do have to be a little bit cautious, however, because if it matches anything within your scene, obviously you're going to chroma key that also. So we can take the tracker, and the renderer, what I'll do is drag them in. It creates a merge as it did before with the other nodes. And then now we can drag that merge over to the media out. If you don't see anything, which you should if you have the last node in the viewer, you right click on the merge, choose swap inputs, and then now we can see everything in the scene together. Just so there's no confusion, on the left hand side, that's everything that we're looking at as far as the text in the plane. So that's part of the 3D environment. What I'm selecting here is part of the 3D environment. And then we're merging that up to the top, which is our 2D environment, which in this case is the background. I'll hit control space. We're going to choose ultra keyer. I'll grab the node, hold down shift, make sure the line changes two colors. We'll put it in between the renderer and the merge. I have the plane in the left hand viewer. We have to be careful with that. If you right click, and you notice if I put lighting on it, it turns a different color. We're going to use this for reference for keying. So just make sure you have lighting off so it doesn't distort the actual color. Now, as mentioned before, if I analyze the scene, we'll see a lot of green in the grass, maybe a little bit of the magenta on the wall over there and blue in the sky, but more of maybe a cyan or a light blue. What I think I'm going to choose for this particular screen is a saturated, relatively dark blue. 
We want to make sure that the Ultra Care node is selected. Then we can come up and grab the eyedropper in the inspector window, drag it over to our window on the left, which is why it's there. And it's keyed out the ground plane, but you may also notice that it affected the sky. The way that we fix that is we want to make sure we still have that same node selected. Click on the rectangle mask, and that will create a mask on the right hand side. We can make adjustments here so that it's not affecting the whole scene, but you also may notice that part of the plane is sticking outside of that mask, so we'll have to make an adjustment on any frame that we see that. So I'll scrub through the footage, and as I just mentioned, any time that we see the plane sticking outside of that mask, we can just extend the width. If we need to, we can also keyframe it. That way, if we don't want to adjust the size, we can adjust the position, and that all depends on your footage. But in this case, we are able to make those adjustments without physically moving that mask. Now, if you're following along, if you select the Merge tab, you do want to make sure that the lighting portion is not selected. We do want the shadows for obvious reasons, but if you select lighting and you look at the viewer on the right-hand side, that's what happens. So you want to have shadow selected, but not lighting. If you go to the first tab, you want everything selected. If you deselect it, you get the scene there with the black plane. There's no lighting on there. So you want everything in that first tab selected on the merge. Let's head over to the spotlight node, and here we're going to work on our shadows. So we can leave that first tab in the inspector open and then move all the way to the bottom. And that last option for softness, we're going to change it from none to variable. And what this is essentially doing is making those shadows a little more realistic. What I'll do here is scroll in on that footage. Right now it's set to variable. If you change it back to none, you'll notice how the shadows look artificial and there's a lot of hard lines. If you'd notice the H shadow on the left hand side there as one example. But if we adjust that to variable, it softens up really nicely. And again, this is just to make the shadows fit better into the scene and look more realistic. There are more adjustments in that section, so if it's not looking realistic in your footage, you can tweak some of the settings over there. The next thing I'm going to do is adjust the color of the text, just to make it fit more into the scene. So I'll use something maybe similar to the color of the building on the right-hand side. Obviously, we're on the text node. We can either use the eyedropper or we can just dial in the settings ourselves. As with the shadows, we're just doing this so that it seems that it fits more into the scene. I like to have these two windows up when making adjustments. This way I have the 3D environment on the left-hand side where I can make the adjustments, and then I can see the results on the right-hand side. The right-hand side being the media out, which is the end of our node tree. What I'm doing here is adjusting the light so that I cast a shadow that's similar to the other shadows in the scene. I know we just discussed this, but what I'll do is select the spotlight node again, and let's look at the shadows now that they're a little bit larger. So right now, the softness is set to variable. We can adjust it to none. You'll notice in the viewer how the lines start to become more rigid. And as I've said a few times, we change it to variable and it becomes more realistic. So we have our footage here and you may notice an obvious problem. It does look relatively realistic in that the text is on the ground and it's casting a shadow in the scene. But the obvious problem being that our subject, it appears to be behind it, but obviously in space, that doesn't make sense. I've already addressed this in another video, and actually I'll link that in the description below. But essentially what you have to do, on the left hand side we have the footage that we've been working on. That's our fusion clip. As in that other video that I mentioned, if we drag another clip on top of it, that's going to be the one that we work on. Clearly if we drag it right on top, all we're going to see is that footage. So what we're going to have to end up doing is going to the color tab and make our adjustments there. Just to show you what the end result is going to be, I've already finished it. So on the right hand side, I'll drag this over our clip on the left. I'll re-enable the layer so that you can see it. And I know that the words are different, but you can see a final product that I've worked on before. And the subject is actually in front of the words as they would be in real life. I won't go into great detail because I did address it in that other video, but let me show you essentially what I did. So here we are in the color tab and you notice that basically all I did was create a mask around her torso area. I did have to manually rotoscope that, and you'll notice the keyframes on the right-hand side. In order to create that mask, I used a window, which you can see in the middle on the bottom there. In the node tree, I did have to right-click and add an alpha output, and then drag the blue line from the node over to that alpha output. If I select highlight mode, you'll see that this is the only thing that's on this layer. Again, the only reason I did that is because that's the only part of our subject that intersects with our 3D object. The logic there being, we don't need to give ourselves extra work. If her whole body doesn't cross over those words, there's no sense of us rotoscoping her entire body. 
And as I showed you before, here is a final product. And of course, there's multiple ways that you can implement this. You can set up a scene where the camera flies through the text and it doesn't have to be text. It could be a 3D object, maybe a spaceship or some other object. So you're not just limited to what I've shown you here. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel and check out some of my other videos. I'll link some right up here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.